they're they're working a day job and you know they're also finding deals on the side and um you know they may not be making a podcast or a website but they're busy folks yeah uh, is work-life balance possible I think the way most people view it, it's kind of a lie that's been perpetrated on us. I think when you ask someone, do you have work-life balance? What goes through their head is this idea that they've got everything arranged so perfectly, you know, that they just, ah, my life is good right now. And the reality is that balance is an activity. It's a verb. It's not a state of being. And so if you're really trying to accomplish big things, especially at work, you're going to focus on the one thing and ignore everything else. You're going to feel out of balance and that's normal. So what we kind of talk about in the book is something called counterbalancing. So you bring awareness to that every week and you don't neglect the things that matter most. So I see people really good at focusing on their one thing at their job, but they'll do that to the detriment of their marriage, their health, their spiritual life and their personal life. And over time, those things can add up to burnout or a heart attack or a divorce, right? So we preach those things in your life need to be counterbalanced on a regular basis. So awareness, again, it all comes back to awareness. Hey, I just worked, you know, a 70 hour week. Maybe I need to take a couple of days off and recharge the batteries, right? It's just like when you work out, you have to rest to actually build strength, right? Those two have to work together. And in the long haul, remember the domino is a long run. Doesn't, it's, you're not going to become a multimillionaire this year, right? If you do, you're just lucky. It's going to be a marathon, not a sprint. So you need to be managing these things. And we just call it counterbalancing. So yeah. the big mistakes are people neglect stuff like their health and their personal life, thinking that they're doing it so that they can have them later, but they may not be waiting on you in 10 years. So you need to be balancing them actively as you go. All right. The, the metaphor you guys used in the book that really worked with me was the, the ballerina. I don't know, the front of their toes and they're kind of floating, looking like they're floating in the air. I want to say plie. I have no idea. What yeah. <laughs> Whatever they're doing. It looks like it's magic, right? From far yeah. away. But when you look up close, they're, their lower body is going forward and their upper body is going back or something like that. It's not that. Right. It's kind I do of this, like if, if, if you're sitting at home watching this, I do this when I give keynotes and I'm talking about this and I just say, all right, everybody stand up and I want you to stand on one foot and you see everybody out there and they're, you know, <laughs> I'll just ask, great. Are you balanced or are you balancing? And uh, invariably everybody will chuckle and go, we're balancing. That's what balance looks like. It's an activity. You have to do it actively. If you just freeze, even a ballerina is going to topple over, right? So it's an active state. Right. So a lot of the, like, these guys, though, you know, you'll buy a property, it'll take you like two or three months of, you know, every night doing something, you know, sending lenders this, and it's kind of a season. Mm -hmm. um, do you see it as seasons or is it more of like a weekly, monthly check-in on, hey, what am I neglecting here? What part of the wheel is not up to par with everything else? Um, I described it earlier. I do a big check-in um, before the year starts on a really big scale. And we look at our investment portfolio. We ask if we need to refinance things. Do we need to acquire more properties this year? Do we need to sell properties, right? And then we set our annual goals. And every week I'm checking in on my expectations in the big areas. And hopefully it's a very short list. It's not a lot of things that matter. So on a grand scale, that's how I do it. But if you're thinking about the cycle of buying an investment property, it's a lot like your down payment, right? You put a down payment on your investment property and it's a small percentage of the value of that property. That's how we get leverage. That's how we get those high rates of return, right? So today, is it about 25% down payment? Would that be an accurate statement on most investment properties? Yeah, right? so if you're gonna get traditional financing. So you're leveraging 75% of the value. I think that in terms of your time and effort, it might be like a 5% deposit. It feels like a lot, right? You have to do all the work to find it. You have to do all the work to get your financing together. Then you have to inspect it. And then you have to close on it. And then for me, if you're renting it, 
we usually have a period of a few weeks of intense, we call it make ready. You know, let's get those carpets out. Let's get some new paint on the walls. And there's a little bit more expense in money and time. We have single family, mostly single family investment properties. I don't know what your market's like, but in our market, maybe two days a year, we have to check in on them actively, right? They come up, not even every year. We have one tenant that's been in one of our properties for seven years. So some of them, it's just they call you and they need some maintenance, and that's just a phone call, right? And you have to arrange something. I don't personally go fix my properties anymore. I did in the very beginning if I could, but now I don't do that anymore. But now we manage them very lightly. So you think about how much money is working for you the other 360 days of the year, and you had to invest parts of a few of them to keep that machine going. I think of that as like a down payment. And you have right. to every now and then do it. It's very leveraged in terms of your time, in my opinion. It just feels intense on the front end. Right. And, and one thing I, I usually recommend, like my coaching clients, is you know when you go out and get that property and you hit that milestone, maybe take like 10% of that cash flow and go and just spend it on dinner or something like that. or, or uh, <laughs> Reward that. yourself. Right, right. Because this is the problem, right? Like there's this concept of, you know, entrepreneurs or investors, you need to put your face mask on first, right? Like replace your W2 income with your passive investments, whether that's a quarter of it, half of it, or all of it. It, it, it takes a while to get up to that point. And you, 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 like we said, you got to kind of be selfish about it, right? You got to, you know, limit associations, not do things that aren't aligned with your, your domino at the time. And you've got to, you got to rush and, put very much focus and intensity into this goal. But the question that I, I'm struggling is at what point do you start to take sort of profits off the table? Not really money profits, but time. Okay. This, this came up last night. We had, um, we have a team of about 30 people on our real estate team. And we, um, our goal is to create 10 millionaires from the people who are in business with us. We've already made two. We got another one approaching the door, but we meet regularly and talk about wealth building. And this came up, like at what point in the journey do you start, instead of acting like the frugal investor, start enjoying some of the spoils of war, you know? And my answer to that is whenever you're on track for the goals that you set yourself, anything that's above that, why wouldn't you enjoy it? Now, early on, I was being really aggressive. And if we had extra money, we always invested it, right? And over time, but if you're not hitting your goal, then it's premature. And so that's the way I look at it. Like we have a net worth goal that we have set for the end of this year. And if we have invested money and are on track for that goal and our cash flow goals are on track and we have excess income, and you know, we generally say one of two things. We, we ask what assets can we buy? What debt can we pay down? And you know, maybe we'll treat ourselves, but we've that frugality. I have a, lucky we have two income streams for gosh for probably 14 years now we've been living on one income stream and the other income stream is purely for investing we want to actually have this is the last five years or so they're going to be in the house with us we're going to maximize that time and we're taking some of the money off the table and i think it's appropriate because we're still on goal and gary has also taught me you never use debt for luxury items so let that sink in. Most, a lot of people will jump out and they'll go buy a Mercedes, but they won't pay cash for it, right? You definitely need transportation, but that could be a bus, that could be a Toyota, or that could be, you know, a Tesla. Those are all viable transportation. So the necessity and then everything above that can be luxury. So we pay cash for those things. So we're paying cash for this renovation. So that's real opportunity cost loss. But we're also at a place where, you know what? We've been doing this for a long time. In the beginning, we lived on 60% of our income and invested the rest. So we understand how to be frugal, but it's also, if we're on track, we're gonna take some money off the table and actually enjoy it. It's just, when is that appropriate? I don't think it's appropriate if you're not on track and you're not behaving like an investor should. Like I said, if you're buying a mansion and using debt to do it, you're, you're playing with some money that you may not have. I, I don't love that. Right, right. I, th I think a lot of my listeners, they're, they're kind of a weird folk where they get pleasure off saving money and 